taking communion together and reorienting our lives once again to what truly matters, that he is good. And he has demonstrated his goodness in that while we are yet sinners, Christ dies for us. Are you kidding me? That is awesome news indeed. We should be jumping off the roof and declaring to the world and shouting his name and praise and just telling everyone we know that there is a God who loves us more than we'd ever imagined and accepts us more than we'd ever ever dreamed of. Amen. So, uh, the power of Rochambeau. I mean, let's be honest, like, who hasn't made decisions of where to go to dinner without a little rock, paper, scissor? Right? Perhaps there is the power of Rochambeau more than we'd ever imagined. This week in Houston, Texas, two drivers, two men, got onto the freeway, but just as they were entering the freeway, were not willing to yield to one another to, for the other to get the right away. As they're entering busy traffic, and the guy rolls down his window and shouts to the other driver, how about a little rocks, paper, scissors? And right there, as they're getting on the freeway, they do a little Rochambeau, not two out of three or three out of five, but one round of Rochambeau, And Mark Sanchez, the guy who initiated the game with the other driver, lost and yielded to the other driver to take the spot on the freeway. The power of Rochambeau. I mean, it could have been a potential road rage incident, huh? I mean, even my children this week did a little Rochambeau for something probably very insignificant. But we wish that conflict could be easily settled by a game of rocks, paper, scissors. I mean, think about it. If if there's any area that most of us have experienced conflict is in the area of marriage. It just seems like such a ripe battlefield for war and conflict and disagreements. And how many times, perhaps, would Rochambeau have have settled the, the issues? For us as husbands to say, honey, let's just rock, paper, scissor it. For the wife to initiate, you know, maybe we rock, paper, scissor it. But yet, conflict isn't that easy to minimize, is it? When it comes to the area of our marriages and the role as husband and role of wife, it is such a difficult terrain to navigate. And I am not up here to tell you I have figured it out. I'm not up here to tell you I have experience perfection in these areas. As far as uh, my experience goes, the more I share about these things with you, the more I'm challenged and convicted by it. Even though I've been married 26 years to the same woman, uh, she has become such a remarkably different woman in those 26 years for for the praise and glory of God. And I, and I think she would basically say the same thing about me that, you know, we both married the wrong person and and yet we've changed significantly as as God's design of marriage usually does. Marriage brings about change and you never marry the perfect person. That we're always works in progress in this thing and and 26 years later there is joy, but that joy did not come without fight. That joy did not come without battles. That joy did not come without war. And as easy as it is to think about maybe our, our romance in the, in the terms of movies like rom-coms. I mean, who likes rom-coms? I mean, who likes those romantic comedies, you know? We need to think of it more like a war film. We need to think of romance like a war film. Because here's one thing I know for certain. That if marriage is meant to be and designed by God to portray Christ's love for the church then you have to believe that the enemy is doing everything he can to destroy that image of Christ loving the church. Right? I mean, Satan's not sitting idly by going, I hope your marriages work out. I hope you succeed as a husband. I hope you do well as a wife. You better believe this morning and forever 
that Satan wants to tear apart the beautiful gospel picture in marriage that God had originally designed, and that here's Christ's sacrificial love on display through the husband, here's the church's receiving of that love and responding to that love, and he will stop at nothing to destroy any image or reflection of Christ in this world, and we would do well to heed the Bible's advice on how we can do better in this area. See, the gospel is what this is about. This is not about your happiness. The happiness is a byproduct of the gospel work, right? No man, no woman is truly happy unless they know and love and have been surrendered to Jesus Christ. There is no such thing as happiness apart from Jesus. There is no part of joy that you will ever taste that, that is not connected with Jesus. And how true in our marriages that we need to realize that there is intense conflict, it is a battlefield, and the enemy is doing all he can to destroy the image of Christ in our marriages in this world. And so that's why we are tackling this as we go through Genesis. Turn to Genesis chapter 2 by way of reminder. Hold your finger there, turn to, turn to Ephesians 5, and I'm going to give you a whole smattering of, of other verses too. So make sure your paper, uh, pen, pencil, outline, your, your smartphone, your tablet, whatever you have is ready to go because I'm going to share with you a, uh, a plethora. Senor, what is a plethora? It's a lot of information. Because last week we dealt with the husbands, and I had a couple husbands get really mad at me. But it was a good kind of angry, right? And notice we, we positioned it perfectly that the men were, most men were gone at the, at the retreat. So you can watch the video. Uh, I did not get any hate mail, which was great. Uh, but last week we talked about the role of husband in marriage. Today we get to talk about the role of wife in marriage. And like I said, I'm not an expert in this area, but I have learned and I've grown so much being married to Lori for 26 years, and even her and I talking through this material as we've been married and as we've even encouraged couples uh, as they're getting married, uh, couples that are already married, and even those that are um, post-married, those who've been divorced, and even maybe thinking about remarriage. And I want you to know, and again, I've said this before, but it's worth reminding all of us that divorce is not the unpardonable sin, Okay? We understand that things happen, and there are, there are reasons why people separate and they get divorced. But you need to know that the church has done a disservice to those that have been through difficult conflict and, and, and terrible marriages. And, and, and while we acknowledge that, and you need to know it's, the unforgivable sin, it's not the unforgivable sin, you need to know also, though, I'm going to be the pastor that's going to raise the level of your urgency to fight for your husband or fight for your wife, all right? And those of you who have been here and that I've met with, either one on, on one or with my wife and I, you know that we don't want to talk about divorce because we believe that the gospel is powerful enough to save and heal your marriages. No matter where you've been and what's happened and what's taken place, the gospel that was power, powerful enough to save your wretched soul and mine the gospel that's powerful enough to rescue us from hell, the gospel that's powerful enough to change my unbelieving heart to a believing heart, the gospel that's powerful enough to chain down, change that, chase down this disobedient, rebellious sinner is powerful enough to heal our broken relationships. And so what we're going to emphasize, and as you've already heard and will hear today, is that you fight, you sacrifice, you give it all you can, even when, and here's the most difficult part about it, when it's not reciprocated. How do you exist in a relationship with somebody that doesn't have the same pursuits you do? You do what God's called you to do. Because you are not going to change the other person. That is God's job. But the gospel which I have put my hope in, and there's no hope in anywhere else but the gospel of Jesus Christ. My hope is in that, that that gospel is powerful enough to change our marriages. And we talked about last week with husbands. We're going to talk about today with wives. Because marriage is the road by which God brings us to himself. 
It is the dynamic, it is the environment, it is the context in which God shapes us into the men and women he wants us to be. So the goal of marriage is not happiness. The goal of marriage is holiness. The goal of marriage is not you changing your spouse. The goal of marriage is God using your spouse to change you. I wish it could be some other way. Trust me. I know this is not how you win friends and influence people, right? This is not the Dale Carnegie speech like, hey, you know. This is like the hard thing to to, to wrap our minds around. That God is going to use my wife to make me more like Jesus. And that God is going to use me to make her more like Jesus. And it's not going to come through me demanding that of her. Her yelling at me about it. It's going to come through sacrifice. And that both parties have to be willing to sacrifice. There is no good marriage without sacrifice. Why? Because this is what the gospel demonstrates for us. So our marriages are really a part of a bigger story that God is telling the world about his son loving rebellious sinners like us. Amen? I mean, communion is about marriage. Think of it this way. The Bible starts with a marriage and ends with a marriage. Genesis 2. Man, woman, Adam, Eve, first marriage. What's the final marriage in the Bible? The marriage supper of the Lamb. God is for marriage. Marriage is God's idea. And yet, we, us, the world has treated it so trivially. Just this morning, I got a news story across my, my feed. Britain is doing a new experiment where you can just pay 500 pounds and do your divorce online, and they have found it to be primarily successful, so they're going to move ahead with making it easier for people to get divorced. No! We're moving in the wrong direction! We need to make it harder for people to get divorced. We don't need to do this online, just send in your check for 500 pounds or pesos or whatever currency you're using. You need to make it harder because marriage is a fight. So, this morning, let's just by means of recap and then a, and a segue into this morning. What the roles of marriage? There's two roles for men and women. The role of man is servant leader, and I'm not going to rehash last week's message and then today. I mean, we'd be here till tonight. We're, we're not going to do that. But the role of the husband is that, that of a servant leader. His main objective is to love his wife as Christ has loved the church. That's that's a tough task, right? This is a difficult job. You know, I'm sure like, you know, when we consider the roles, and especially when we talk about the wife's role, you know, I think some ladies would be like, can I have the husband's role instead? And there's going to be some ladies like, I'm going to pray for my husband because that's a lofty role, right? Men loving their wives, husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. And he does that through sacrifice. He does that through surrender. He does that at a great expense. But yet he considers it a worthy pursuit. Did not Christ show us that there is this ability to restore the image of God in us that was marred by sin? And he went to the point of dying a death on a cross that he did not deserve to die. And yet he displayed, here he is, the son of God, the lamb, who is yet lion-hearted in so many ways, right? Meek and mild, but yet he is the son. He is the one by whom all, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord one day. So there's, there's a toughness and a tenderness with Jesus. And this is what we as men do with our wives. We love them the way Christ has loved the church. So if a husband's role is servant leader, What is the wife's role? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, so many churches, so many pastors, so many books would say that the wife's role is submission. It's not. Submission has been this word that has been used as a tool to to suppress women, for men to misuse authority and have an unbiblical dominion. 
The wife's role is not submission. The wife's response to the husband's role may be submission. But the wife's role, you ready for this? Wise partner. Wise partner. And the reason I say that is because you have in Genesis chapter 2, God acknowledging something is not good with man. Remember, he's all alone. He's naming all the animals. And as God in Genesis 2, starting at verse 18, where God says, it is not good for man to be alone. There was not an animal among the world that God had created that was suitable for Adam. So, so what does God do? He fashions from his rib, one of his ribs, a woman. And he says, you will be his helper. You will be his complement. You will be his partner because he is lacking something and that without her, he will continue to lack. And so God is the one who now deems this woman to come alongside man because 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, it's not man that was created for woman, it was woman that was created for man. Amen, ladies? We are less of a person without you. Husbands must come to a point where they acknowledge that they need not just a partner, they don't just need a help, they need someone who's going to be wise. And let me just tell you, women, again, you are wise in ways that we as men are not. We celebrate gender differences and understand the wiring that makes us who we are as men and who you are as, as women, that God has created us in the image of God, and, and, and there's an equality of our value and our significance and our worth. But lest you lump us into one thing and, and don't celebrate the differences in how we're wired, you disparage the word of God. The Boy Scouts are now including girls in on this. And I love the little meme that's going out there in social media like, you know, where does it say it should be boys? Uh, in the title, Boy Scouts, right? Duh. Boy Scouts, best two weeks of my life. When I was in third grade, which I'll remind you were the best four years of my life. So uh, you got that. So, see, the world wants us to not recognize the differences. But when you fail to recognize the differences, you fail to be the person God has qu called you to be. You're either XX or XY, and there's nothing you can do about it societally that's going to change that. We recognize that, boy, my wife brings things to the table and I bring things to the table and we just oftentimes have a different way of perceiving things or understanding things. And it's exactly that that God uses to leverage the relationship so that we become better people. This is why marriage is between one man and one woman because you have one man with one man. Well, guess what? They see things too similarly. It doesn't make sense biologically, physically, psychologically. Woman with woman, same thing. This is why marriage is one man plus one woman for one lifetime forever. And so the role of the husband, servant leader, the role of the wife, wise partner. Now what is the picture of this in the Bible? And what I love is that there is a picture. Last week, you remember the pattern for men was, Ephesians 5, Christ loving the church and dying for the church, sacrificing himself for the church. The picture for wives is the Trinity. Write this down. Because what you have in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or for the King James enthusiast, the Holy Ghost, right? Well, one God... One God, sorry, if you're a King James only person, forgive me, all right? One God who makes himself known in three persons, okay? We don't worship many gods, we're monotheist, but this God has always eternally lived in community within himself, and that community consists of three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So two things you need to understand about the Trinity. Number one, that there in the Trinity are identical attributes. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit 
are equal in power, equal in love, equal in mercy, equal in justice, equal in holiness, equal in knowledge, equal in all other qualities. What is true of God the Father is true of God the Son. What is true of God the Son is true of God the Spirit. And again, the Trinity is one of those theological concepts that we find in the Bible that there comes a point where our blood shoots out our eyeballs because it's just so beyond us to understand what this Trinitarian community looks like and how it operates. But what we know is that there are three distinct persons, yet one God. But what I want to emphasize with you is the second point in your notes, and that is the Trinity each has distinct roles. Because what you don't have is the Father dying on the cross for your sins. What you don't have is the, is the, is the Son coming and dwelling within hearts of believers to empower them to, life, to live the life that they are destined to live. See, what you have to acknowledge is that within the Trinity, while they are co-equal, co-eternal, all those attributes, they have distinct roles. And here's the beauty of it. They're willing to submit to one another in those roles within the Godhead. John 17, write that passage down. You have Jesus praying to the Father. I want to do your will. I want to honor you. I want to accomplish the mission that you have sent me to accomplish for your glory and that I share in that glory. And when we are glorified together, the world gets to experience that. I mean, is there a reason why Jesus, the Son of God, was in the garden and prayed to the Father, not my will, but your will be done. Ladies and gentlemen, what you have is a self-effacing submission within the Trinitarian Godhead that now serves as a picture for us to go, whoa, if they are doing this, what does that command or demand of me now that I'm a part of that relationship? Because in Christ, you're part of that Trinitarian community. You have, you have a relationship with God, you have a relationship with the Son, you have a relationship with the Spirit. And I don't think there's a better picture for wives than what we see in the ministry of Jesus Christ. So whereas Ephesians 5 is really a pattern for the husbands, more in the crucifixion context, what we see with wives is the submission of Jesus to a, to a higher authority. And there's wisdom there, and there's a partnering there that we need, need to understand. Write down a couple of these verses. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. Look up on the screen. Philippians 2, verse 4 and 5. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which was also yours in Christ Jesus, who did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself to serve a greater will than his own. Right? This is Paul's way of saying, church, you need to consider others as more important than you. You need to serve others more than you serve yourself. You need to think of others more highly than you think of yourself. So Paul says, this is the mentality that Jesus had. Now you couple this with 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, and then we're starting to really understand the Trinity and Philippians 2 connection. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, but the head of Christ is God. So Paul wants you to understand that there are distinct gender roles within marriage. And lest you think your headship as a husband is one where you command and you demand and you bark orders and your wife exists to serve every little bit of your whim and will, you're mistaken. You have a head, and his name is Jesus. And who's the head of Jesus? God the Father. So you see this, this, this relationship dynamic that in no way communicates inferiority. If anything, it communicates this idea of there is a self-effacing, self-sacrificing submission that ought to exist not just in the Trinity, but in all of our lives. 
because it's not just wives who are called to submit. It is me as a husband who is called to submit because I submit to the Lord Jesus Christ as Christ himself submitted himself to the Father. And this is really the spirit of Ephesians chapter 5. Turn your Bibles there if you would. Ephesians 5. Paul, in this chapter that's going to lead into marriage, just before he, di- he dives into marriage, he says, you mutually submit to one another because you are spirit-filled people and have the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Probably one of the greatest demarcations of any healthy church is the willingness of that community to submit to one another. The church is not an environment for power grabs. I've been a part of churches like that. That's not fun. The the church is not an environment where, hey, we serve your will and make sure your will gets done no matter what. No, no, we all fall under the lordship of Christ and we mutually submit to his lordship, whether you're a man or woman. And that, that submission comes out in our, in, our way, in our leadership meetings. It comes out in our kids' ministry. It comes out in the band context. It comes out in a, in a teaching opportunity. Like Wherever we may be together, there ought to be the spirit of a willingness to mutually submit to one another. This defined the ministry of Christ. And so submission is a beautiful thing when understood it, it's a willingness, I'm going to place myself under the authority of. You submit to my leadership, and I think many of you willingly do it because you know what? I'm not the one who's just going to demand things of you. I, I'm pleading passionately with you that you know I want your good and I want my good because we're going to serve a God who's ultimately good, right? And that we submit like, okay, if pastor says that, I want to submit to that because I want what's best for you. And just like if you came to me with some, and there are people who have come to me and they've said, hey, I need to address something with you, and I've submitted to their counsel, I've submitted to their advice. That's what we're about. I'm not up here to be like, I know it all. I've figured it all out, and don't you dare challenge anything I say. Because I don't lead that way at home, do I? There's a 20 spot waiting for you. Thank you for that answer. I know. Oh, you'll take the 20. Yeah, you will. So the submission idea is not a forced submission. Men, you don't demand submission from your wives. The wife responds. This is her response to a man who loves her and leads her like Jesus. And again, that is not a job that you can do in and of your own strength. Whatever God commands you to do, he's going to empower you to do it. Men, he can help you love and lead like Jesus. Amen? And what woman would not want a husband that loves and leads like Jesus? Amen? This is what we are wired to want and desire. And so, you know, one of the books that was written years ago, love, The Love Languages. You guys ever read The Love Languages? Yeah, sinners. Um, so... This five, whole, this five love languages, right, which I've never really bought into. I love how one writer says there's actually only one love language for everybody. You ready? It's called self-denial. Write that down. I don't want to talk about gift giving and quality time. There's one love language clearly spelled out in Scripture, and it's this, self-denial. Sorry to burst your bubbles, you guys. I know all that conference money gone down the drain. So, the picture, the Trinity. And again, this is a lo- we're raising the bar high because there is, it's going to be tough. Marriage is difficult. And yet, it is one of the most beautiful, one of the most joyful experiences any two people, man and woman, can share together. So men, we have the cross and the sacrifice of Christ as our model <laughs> Ladies, you have the Trinity and, the, and the, the submission of Jesus as your picture of what it means to willingly place yourself under the authority or, or headship of somebody. What does this look like in practice? Four things I want to talk about. And again, I'm so glad my wife is here because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean on her for clarification. I'm going to lean on her for just maybe just kind of sealing it up a bit, bit better than what I'm able to say. I, I've got a a swarm of stuff going through my head. And like I tell you, even though I've taught on this so many times, every time I present it, I want to 
come from a fresh perspective, all rooted in the word of God, but I'm seeing things differently. I'm understanding things differently. The things I'm teaching today, I would have never taught 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And so praise God for my wife who's here. And, and if there's something you need to interject, just do a little of this. Wave that 20 spot in the air. Get my attention. Okay. So the practice of wives as wise partner, and we're going to use wisdom as the jumping off point. Because again, I think God has wired women with this <laughs> uncanny, innate sensibility to not only perceive things within, but to perceive things that we as men generally just miss. We see that with characters throughout the scripture. Um, women like Sarah, who married a guy named Abraham, who is the father of three major world religions, right? And yet, he failed oftentimes as a leader. And yet, Sarah, with wisdom, commit, committed herself to him as a leader. And that was through great territory, and that was through some difficult territory. There's a woman by the name of Abigail who was married to a guy named Nabal, whose li name literally means fool. So be careful with names, ladies, of guys you start dating and, you know, hey, how you doing? My name's fool. It's like, run, run, right? So Abigail marries this guy named Nabal, who is this hot-headed dude who's just ready to kill King David, and Abigail just kind of steps in the way and, and brings a little bit of calm and peace to the situation. I mean, there's wisdom there. We see the wisdom of women in Jesus' ministry. Jesus surrounded himself with, with women in the culture that would suppress women. Jesus elevated their status. So did Peter. So did Paul. I mean, so what you see throughout Scripture is a recognition of women with this incredible sense of wisdom that they're able to bring to certain contexts. Four things I want to talk about. Number one, there's the wisdom in helping. So we go from Genesis 2, right, where God has created woman and give, has given her the designation helper. And this is not an inferior designation. This is a, this is a word that is used of, of God himself. This is the word that Jesus gives us in John 14 where he says, I'm going to send a helper, i.e. the Holy Spirit, to dwell within you. And so God himself identifies himself as a helper. So what does it mean for a woman to exercise wisdom in helping? Well, what it does is it starts to work within us this idea of our distinction. Now, when Lori and I were first married 26 years ago, there's no way we understood this. There's, there's, you know, we're, we're, we're barely 22, right? We're barely 22. I'm marrying her right out of her parents' house. And all of a sudden, we're married, we're living in an apartment, and we're just trying to figure out life together. And I think for the first couple of years, your parents thought we fought more than we kissed. We fought more than we, we made love. We fought more than anything. Like, they're looking at us like going, are you, are you guys going to survive? Like, we were constantly battling, fighting, arguing. Why? Because number one, we're two type A personalities. We're two stubborn people. We're two hard-headed people. It's like there's an old show called Heart to Heart back in the 70s. And it says, when they met, it was murder. Like, that, that was like Lori and I. And yet what God has done since then is he's saying to us that your enemy is not your spouse. The battle is not to be one had between. The battle is one figuring out how you complement one another. How you are distinct. We are, we are equal, but we're different. And so, boy, God started working when we started to understand, okay, I don't want to get upset about his differences or her differences, but I want to understand them so that it makes our marriage better versus weaker. And so Lori has grown in her understanding of what I need as far as help. And trust me, I, I need a lot of help, all right? Uh, you would think I'd marry a psychologist or a counselor or a therapist or something, but I have my wife to help me grow in my ability to lead her and my kids. And I'm going to tell you right there, those are probably the two most important areas of help that my wife can bring to the table. Number one, to me as, as a husband in our marriage, and number two, to our children, because her number one ministry is me and the kids. I'm going to say that, with a little caveat that says that doesn't mean that she doesn't leave the house and that her only life is me and the kids. Please hear what I'm not saying. My wife does an incredible job of, of being my wife and loving me with a love I never thought possible. 
But I, and I will tell you, she loves our kids in ways I sit there and go, thank you, God, because there, there's, you know, I'd be three minus children if it was left up to me. So her greatest ministry, her primary role that God has assigned to her is to be my helper and minister to me and my children. She works. She's not always barefoot and pregnant. You know, that's one of those things we got to kind of admit, you know, get a, she is out in the community. She's involved in people's lives. She's doing music with bands at Sozo on the weekend. She's meeting you guys for lunch. She's, she's, I sit there and go, where do you find the energy and the time and just the mental capacity to do these things? She is like Proverbs 31 woman. Write this down, Proverbs 31. You have a woman who works. She brings her husband good. She, in her wisdom, not only works, but she's got people who work for her. She makes money. She buys land. She's got a reputation in the community. And her husband and the children rise up and they bless mommy each and every day. How many of you women would love to have your husbands and your children bless you, right? They, re they show her great praise and honor. And I'm sitting there going, wow. See, we have relegated women to this role as wife and mother, and there's nothing else. There's so much more to my wife than just that. And yet, this is the greatest help. See, she brings help to the household, but she brings help to the world. She brings help to the community. And this is a woman that is far more excellent than we'd ever imagine. Isn't that what Proverbs says? An excellent wife who can find. Because she is this woman who is so well-rounded that sees her primary ministry as her home, but is active also beyond the home. And I will tell you that there should be no activity, wives, that you're involved in that takes away from your ministry to your husband and your kids. Okay? This is what God holds you accountable for. We see it not only in Proverbs 31, we see it in Titus chapter 2, verses 3, 4, and 5. The older women minister to the younger women and remind them of how important it is to take care of their marriages, their children, and then all the other stuff that comes along with living. And so when I was working four jobs at one time, my wife saw it as her primary ministry to me was to make sure that when I came home from one of the jobs, my kids were totally confused about what I did. For those of you that don't know, I was a church planting pastor. I was a barista at Sozo Coffee. I worked for FedEx, and I also cleaned pools for my father-in-law. So my kids would be asked by students in their class, what does your dad do? Oh, he's the FedEx pastor, coffeehouse, pool guy. Like, what is that? And yet my wife knew how much I was working for the family, sacrificing for the family, and she considered it her ministry at that moment to say, when my husband comes home, I want to provide a context that he finds it easy to love me and love the kids in. Amen? Anything you'd add to that? Because I am talking about you a lot. Are you? Uncomfortable good? Okay, oh, fine. I didn't say anything about cooking. You're bringing cooking into this. Did I say anything about cooking? Okay. But I do like cooking, as you guys can tell, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Who is Susie Homemaker? I don't know who this character is. <laughs> I know. But... I want you to know, as she's in this, and again, this is perfect because what my wife needs is for me to acknowledge how hard she is working for me. I'm not going to take that for granted. And this is why we have prized for many, many years a date day together. 
okay? She needs adult time. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can be around the kids so much, and it's like you got Play-Doh coming out your ears, and it's like, I need a break, right? So once a week, I take her out, and it's almost like dating. It's almost like, okay, kids aside, ministry aside, work aside, this is time for you and I to bond. I'm going to tell you right now, an inexpensive date day is a lot cheaper than professional therapy. I'm saving you guys a lot of money right now. You take your wife out and help replenish the spirit and the soul of which she is pouring endlessly from. Go to a dinner. Go to... You will make time for what's important, right? You need to sacrifice your little luxuries and hobbies, guys, to make sure your wife is ministered to because she is giving more than you will ever understand. And when I take her out and we sit down and we're having a meal together, I'm always going to ask two questions. This is gold. Write this down. How am I doing as a husband? How am I doing as a father? Because once a week, I need her to speak into my life. Wisdom helping me. Wisdom saying you've been a little bit more brash with the children than you're used to being. What's going on? Help me process this. How am I doing as a husband? Am I neglecting you? Is there something I'm taking for? Boy, when she is given that opportunity to speak, it's gold. It is, it is, a, it is a salve that heals the wounds. It instills hope. It brings a sense of fullness to this that God has designed us to do. And yet I talk to men and women who are like, yeah, when was the last time you had a date? Well, it was probably six months ago. What? You need to feed the most important relationship outside of Christ, and that is with your spouse. So you move mountains, and you take one night a week, one afternoon a week, and you go out together, and you talk. Respectfully, loving, self-denying, you talk. Because if you starve that, you're going to choke the relationship. My wife's sending out a tweet right now. Something gold. I can just tell. Amen? What do you mean, don't have it? I'm sorry. This is, this is how we talk. So, Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm talking to the men primarily. Does it matter? Do it. Yeah. 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 The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. Folks, what's going to change? What are you going to tweak? And it's not that I can't. Scratch the word from your vocabulary. The real word, if we're honest, is I won't. We saw a movie last week, Tully. It was heading down directions I didn't want to go, and then I'm not going to ruin the movie. But the husband, every night, would put on his headset and play a video game while his wife is in bed next to him. I'm going, are you freaking kidding me? Like, this is your marriage? Like, here is this bed that is designed not just for rest, but for intimacy. And you're going to play video games while your wife wants to connect with you? Grow up. I'm not saying video games are wrong. Trust me, my kids are like, Dad, FIFA. I'm like, let's do it. But I'm saying, men, be who God wants you to be and connect with your wife. There is a wise helper there that is designed by God to make the situation better. It's not your enemy. She is an advocate. 
Amen? Did I interrupt you? I'm sorry. It's your what? My message? <laughs> you told me. You told me. You're, I was, I was, yeah. Don't, 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 don't ruin it. Yeah, he learned. He learned the hard way. That's all we're going to say about that. Yep, it's true. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she asked me the same questions. How am I doing as a wife? How am I doing as a mother? I know. <laughs> and I'm paying the bill for lunch. So I'm like, man, I'll tell you what. Laying my heart out there and I'm picking up the check? Okay. No, just I didn't I didn't say that. Don't you love this? I love her so much. Um connect with your wives. And ladies, when you have the opportunity to speak into your husband's life, use wisdom in how you approach it, timing and tone. Timing and tone. Okay? When there's an invitation, boy, thank God for the invitation, and yet tread carefully. Right? The most insecure people in the world are men. It's true! The most insecure people in the world are men. And guys, I can say that because I'm part of that breed. You know what I'm saying? So wisdom in helping. Number two, wisdom in respecting. And I will tell you that the, the respect that a woman gives her husband is going to bring about changes in your marriage that you did not think possible. There was a guy who wrote a book years ago called Love and Respect, and his premise was this. Men run on respect while women run on love. And I will tell you that when you boil it all down, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, look at this, even Paul. However, let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Notice, the men love servant leadership and the women respect wise partner. Men do not exist to be loved. It is so hard for men to love. They exist in a context where they seek respect. If you ask me about my staff at Sozo, you know, we got about 10 baristas that work for me. You ask me, would you rather you have your baristas love you or respect you? That's a no-brainer. Respect me. I could care less if you love me. Like, that's a men's attitude. Right? Because why? Men are independent while women are interdependent. There are gender differences. And so what we have to understand is that respect is something that is fuel for a man. And when he is respected, he loves the wife the way she needs to be loved. And yet when that, with, with that respect is withdrawn, there's no love. And there's this vicious cycle. The less men and women respect, the less men love. The less men love, the less women respect. And we wonder why we're having the problems we're having. So the greatest way a wife can help her husband is to respect him. And again, it is a respect that is not based upon his performance. It is a respect based upon his position. I'll start respecting when he fill in the blank. That's not the gospel. God doesn't say, you know, I'll love you when you, you couldn't do anything. You were incapable of loving God. That's why John says he loves you. He first loved you, and now you only love because he first loved you. So you have to understand, you may not like the way he acts, but that doesn't mean he's not worthy of respect. He is given to you so that you can respect him. And if you can't submit to him as far as this means of respect, then you submit to the higher authority, the Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to your own husbands as you submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians chapter 5. So a woman has to trust and a woman has to believe and a woman has to pray. A wife 
who is married to someone who is hard to respect, that's got to be a very horrific type environment, a tragic, a sad, a, a discouraging environment. But nonetheless, here's what the Bible says, you still respect. First Peter chapter 3. Wives, and it's not this one, but this, this is ultimately what we're getting to. Verse 2 of First Peter 3. Wives, without speaking a word, live a respectful and chaste life before your husband. Because any, if any of them are disbelieving, let them be won over by your respectful and chaste behavior. Ladies, you're married to a guy who doesn't know Jesus. Ladies, you're married to a guy who doesn't have a heart for Jesus. You're living with a guy who doesn't emulate the spirit of Christ. And yet those are the things you want. It doesn't, it's not going to accomplish anything by you telling him what to do telling him how to act, yell at him how he needs to change his life. What you need to do is close your mouth and act accordingly like Jesus in the relationship. And let it be your respectful and chaste behavior that changes him. Because then we get to twenty to verse 5 in 1 Peter 3, where Peter says these words, that for this is how the holy women of hope in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands. Notice the phrase, hoped in God. Your hope is not in your marriage. Your hope is not in your husband. Your hope is not in your job. It's not in your house, how well you prepare a meal. Your hope is not in your looks, how well your children are obeying you. Your hope is in one place, God. That is our only hope. And so, what you have to understand is that respecting your husband is based upon his position, not his performance. And yet, what we pray is that those husbands see their wives living with that spirit of Christ and they're convicted by that. Respect from a wife has the potential to bring conviction. Love from a husband is able to bring conviction to a wife. And isn't it interesting that God has wired us to give the other person the thing that we're not naturally inclined to give? If I want respect, you know, what does it say? Do unto others as you have them do unto you? No, this is where this doesn't count. Right? It's like the guy who bought his wife a shotgun for Christmas. And the next year the wife says, well, I'm going to buy myself a very nice set of pearls for Christmas. Right? Like, and I just got, I got into trouble. I'm going to tell you right now, I bought my wife a, a Mother's Day gift. Mother's Day is next Sunday, FYI. I bought her a gift, and honestly, it's more for me than for her. And I feel awful about that. I'm not going to tell her what it is. She's going to have to wait. <laughs> right? It's more for me. But yet in marriage, we're called to respect our husbands. Men, we're called. And yet those are the very things that are opposite of how we're wired. C.S. Lewis said it like this. Women are better at loving than men are. Men are, do well at respecting and are better than women are. Lewis observed that women think of love as taking trouble for others, which is much closer to a scriptural agape love than what men naturally do. Men tend to think of love as not giving trouble to others. And now as men, I am called to take trouble from my wife, which is love in the agape sense. And for women, it is to not give trouble to my husband. Think of it like that. Whoa, pretty cool. So men run on respect, wives run on love. Number three, uh, wisdom in deferring. Deferring. What does deferring mean? It means there comes a point when a decision has to be made. You ever been in that, that place of an impasse in your marriage? And you're both like, nope, I'm fighting for this. I'm not backing down. I want this. He wants that. And this is where perhaps sometimes the biggest battle with pride takes place. I'm going to tell you guys something right now. Of the last five cars we've bought for our family, four of them my wife never saw before we bought it. What does that mean? It means she said, you know what I want. You know our price range. I trust you. How many of you ladies would, would just let your husband buy a car without you seeing it? Knowing about it? Okay, two or three of you, you're blessed. Amen, amen, amen. But here's, here's, 
going into it, here's how my wife could defer to me. Here's some of the options I would like to have in a car. Boom, boom, boom. She lists all the things. Okay, what are the ones you're going to die for? What are the ones that we're willing to kind of maybe discuss and die? She knew that she had given to me everything she would want, and then she says, go and buy. And I did that. And, and we've bought good cars. Why? Because she trusted me. Is that awesome or what? Why are you laughing? Yay! Here's the good cars! Yeah, yeah. Now, I will tell you, that doesn't mean I haven't deferred to her in things. We just made a difficult decision about next year where we're going to send one of our kids to school because we're, we're changing schools. And I fought against it. And yet my wife wanted, and she came to me, and she laid out her, and I eventually came to a point where I said, you know what? I'm going to defer to you on this decision. Why? Because we engaged in conversation. She told me all the pros, weighed all the... It was a tough decision, but I ultimately said, I respect the decision. I will defer to you. So does this, does this mean that the women always defer to the husbands? No. But it's saying that in a context of conversation, there comes a point where you say, I've said everything I can say. I've given you all my opinions. And most of the time, she's going to defer to me and say, do you know what's best for me and the family? And that is a context in which deferring is wonderfully experienced. Anything you would add to that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Don't be that wife, please. Because again, that just it sows disrespect. Yeah. 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 And I, I'm so glad you said that because it reminds me that what we're talking about generally may have different applications in your marriage relationship, okay? I may share an example, and it is purely for example. I'm not saying you need to do exactly what we're doing in our, room, our, our household. But the general principles are the same. How their experience may look different in your context. But again, it is in a spirit of self-denial. It is in a spirit of, if I make a bad decision, my wife's not harping on me because of that bad decision. If she makes a bad decision, I'm not harping on her. Why? Because that does nothing to build the team of marriage. Amen? And so we will defer, and oftentimes she's looking to me, and I get to exercise that leadership. And the more I demonstrate a Christ-based love and leadership of the marriage, the more she's able to trust me, the more she's able to defer to me. That doesn't mean, boy, I'm on a course for perfection because I'm still going to mess up. But it's done in a context where we want the good for, for our home and not to take away from that. And so anything you want to add or are you good? Is it? Okay, we'll, we'll move on. So I'll defer to what Lori just said. Okay, uh, last point is uh, wisdom and hope. And I've already touched on this. Boy, but that first Peter passage is so incredibly important because women are called to hope and they may be in a context where they're losing hope. They're living with a disobedient husband. Where they're, lead, they're living with a husband who doesn't believe. And, and what's the emphasis of Peter to the wives is trust God, hope in God. The women throughout Scripture, many examples had to do this. And, and so you need to grow in hope, and that can only be fueled by a relationship with Jesus Christ. Where your husband has deficiencies, Christ makes up for those deficiencies. Where your husband lacks, Christ makes up more in those areas where he lacks. Amen? So you're not going to marry the most perfect, compatible husband, but what you have by faith is relationship with the bridegroom, Jesus, who's going to bring you the fulfillment that you were designed to get from him, not from your husband. 
See, the expectations in our marriages are so unrealistic. When they go unmet, we feel so depleted, and yet we were never meant to have those expectations fulfilled in our spouse. They can only be fulfilled in Christ. And then the last point is this, the promise for wives. You can read about it in Titus 2. You can read about it in 1 Peter 3. And it's this, that God sees your life. He knows your heart. He's watching your demonstration of obedience. And especially in the most difficult of contexts, he knows it and he's going to reward you accordingly. The word in Peter is, he will bless you. For being in an environment that is so difficult to be in, he sees it and he's going to bless you. I don't know what shape or form that blessing comes in, but you ought to know and you ought to experience by means of the Holy Spirit when you honor God and you know you're being obedient to him, that is the greatest reward knowing that you're doing the will of the Father in your life even when it's difficult, even when it's not being reciprocated. So ladies, please hear this that the reward, the promise, is that God will reward you for faithfulness, even in the most difficult of circumstances. Anything in closing? Is it good? Yeah. Pray. And let me close by this. Not only is Lord, are Lori and I available to talk, there are couples here. I can think of John and Becky Ferguson, who I think they're sleeping. They're at Bedside Baptist this morning. So um, Norm and Paula. How many years have you guys been married? 40 years? You guys are like 43 years old. You get married when you're three years old? Norman Powell, raise your hands. Donna and Kevin. Donna. Where did he go? Oh, he's in the restaurant. <laughs> let's all laugh at him when he comes out, right? No, no, let's not do that. Um, Mike and Linda Bachmeyer. I mean, awesome. J- uh, Jerry and Kurt Cornelius. Where are you guys at? Um, I mean, these are these are couples that... For me, I mean, there's probably other couples I haven't, but there are men and women here that want to share with you our experiences. Uh, There's a marriage conference coming in June called Family Life Marriage Conference. Uh, We will send out information on that. If you use the code for Missio Day, you get like 100 bucks off. It's a great conference. Um, Avail yourself to, to think. Read the book, The Meaning of Marriage by Tim and Kathy Keller. The best book on marriage. Kim and Kathy Keller, The Meaning of Marriage. And we are praying for you guys. It, this, this is such a hard message to give, but it's also a, a wonderful message to give because I'm the eternal optimist. I'm going to be your cheerleader. I'll criticize when necessary, but I'm going to be the one rooting for you. Because God's pro-marriage, I'm going to be pro-marriage. Amen? So thanks, you guys, for letting me work this out and yell and lean on my wife and She's awesome. I thank God for her. So before I start crying, let's pray. Lord, this is such a delicate area for for us. And it's it's delicate because there are those who have experienced good. They've they experienced a blessing. And there are some that have not experienced the, the difficulties and the trials. And, and it's delicate because we don't want to ruin that. So help those marriages continue to get stronger. And it's delicate for others because... For some, their marriages are hanging by a thread. There's some where men have shirked their responsibilities and women have shirked their responsibilities and, and there's this difficulty and there's, there's just this taste of just discouragement. And I'm asking you, Father, to strengthen what they may perceive as hopeless. Lord, instill within them a faith trust, a hope that things can get better, things can be healed. That you're a God who's journeying with them through these valleys. Because you're a God who's for marriage, not against it. 
So I pray that there's those men here that you would be their, their strength, be their, their inspiration. Allow the men, the husbands in this context to, to be yielded to you and may you just reign supreme as Lord over their hearts. And for the wives to, to trust and to hope once again where much of that's been diminished. Breathe into their spirits and their hearts this sense of you're a God who can reconstruct and build up that which the enemy is trying to tear down. And may we, this this church community, be a context in which marriages will point to the the miracle of, of Jesus. That marriages would find their healing and their hope and their everything in Christ. And may we bring to this world a testimony that you're a God who can do the seemingly impossible to men and women whose lives are yielded to the Lordship of Christ. Thank you for today, for being our God and loving us in Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his face to you and give you grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great day, all right? Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out thechurchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.